Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming out at a different hour and on a different day. We hadn't known that we'd have the pleasure of having our, I think our, probably our most frequent recollection lector ever, Father Joseph Hamilton, uh, Hamilton speaking, but we figured we don't know how much longer you're in town, so we better, you know, collect them all now. I wanted to say two things. I was, I was attempting to use the new technology. My inner Luddite stopped me, so I'm going to revert to paper. If we don't have your email address and you'd like us to, to receive information about these lectures or anything else Pusey House uh, does, please add your email address to this. You hear all the other. Hello, probably also, but maybe the gentleman behind you is. Yes, okay. Secondly, I understand right now it's more difficult at, to give to anything, but if you would like to give something, there's a machine here for a card, just put the amount in uh, and, and tap. Or um, ready money is also fine. Um, not required, but encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> and without further it's a, ado, explosive device. <laughs> <laughs> it will blow up if it's not fed. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. That that being said, <laughs> he said it looks like there's a bomb in there. It's like it's blinking at you. That being said, prophecy in a time of persecution, visions and miracles in the letters of Cyprian of Carthage. I don't know about you, but. I only know two or three persons who are experts in um, Cyprian of Carthage. One of them is here, and when he's not here, he's elsewhere. And that's the other person. So thank you for th thank you for treating us to this. And anything Father Joseph does for us is both excellent, learned, interesting, and full of demons. So I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure eventually we'll get to, de to, to demonology, which is which is his his great expertise, which connects, of course, to to prophecy and to pneumatology. Father Joseph is going to argue that the activity of the Holy Spirit through visions and prophecy were an important part of the life of the third century North African church. They influenced the Synod 243 at Carthage and help us to understand the relation between pneumatology, prophecy, and a word that I don't know if I'd ever seen in, rendered in English before. And the pronunciation is it onerology? Oneros. Oneros, onerology. Yes, onerology. That is dreams and their interpretation, the study of dreams and their interpretation. So, without further ado, I'll hand this over to Father Joseph Hamilton for his talk. Thank you. On the topic of demons, if I was an uncharitable cleric, I might say something about Constantinople being the capital, but. <laughs> We're all friends here, <laughs> brothers and friends in Christ. Anyway, um, I'm pleased to announce that I'm coming to the end of my great purgatorial journey towards my defil. Mm -hmm. The entire uh, thing is now drafted. Um, it is filled with demons, <laughs> but they're all, um, I sandwiched them all into the very last chapter, so if my supervisor thinks that it's uh, too, uh, too risky, I can... I can cut out that chapter and still have sort of 87,000 words. So. But we, uh, we might touch a little bit on the demonic today, but um, really, I'm more interested... Exorcism was regarded as one of the highest of the charisms in the early church, and exorcists were very highly respected. But higher even than exorcism was the, prophes was the charism of prophecy. And in fact, uh, Christians were exhorted to pray for the gift of prophecy. And how prophecy looked in the early church, as opposed to how it looks today in evangelical and charismatic communities, and what patristics can say to those communities is one of my principal um, areas of interest. And indeed, what is the Holy Spirit saying uh, in prophecy today to the mainstream churches? Um, <clears throat> the phenomena of prophecy is defined today in Christian theology apophatically as private revelation because it's obviously outside of the public revelation brought by Christ and his disciples. Um, but as I said, in the early church, these forms of discernment prophecies were considered superior even to that of exorcism. Uh, and the source of all prophecy is the Holy Spirit or the paraclete. 
The phenomenon of prophecy is clearly attested to in the Old Testament and the Gospels and frequently occurs in the early Christian literature. The Shepherd of Hermas, the Ascension of Messiah are two texts that immediately spring to mind, as are the Acts and the Passiones of the Christian martyrs, which are replete with visions and dream sequences, particularly the, um, the African uh, accounts of the martyrs. Um, but this afternoon, we're going to focus on the early Latin literature. So, as opposed to last year when we looked at Origin of Alexandria in this lecture, we're now going to go to Roman North Africa or Africa Proconsularis. I imagine we're all aware at this moment in time that the Western Church is suffering, and I include Catholic uh, and Protestant confessions in that statement, is suffering one of the greatest crises in her history. Parallels can be found in the patristic period. The mass apostasy of faithful, religious, priests and bishops is beginning to rival, if we believe St. Jerome, that of the Arian crisis. But what is more distressing is that those who, are, those who are apostatizing are not leaving, for example, the Christian church or the church of Constant, the Orthodox church, Roman church or Orthodox church to go to a form of you know, scriptural Christianity. They're leaving to embrace a neo-paganism, a sort of an eldritch mockery of Christianity that retains some of the external trappings of the church, but internally is pandemonium. And I mean that in the Miltonic sense of the world, word. In many parts of the world, we're seeing huge swathes of the faithful move to very, very odd Pentecostal and charismatic congregations. And I, don't, I mean that outside of the mainstream evangelical movements. And they are referred to as spirit-filled communities, and they claim to resemble the early church. But that's a myth. It's utter nonsense. The early church was sacramental. You can read it in Origin, you can read it in, all across Cyprian. At best, these movements might resemble more the Cataphrygians, or the New Prophecy Montanism, which had at its heart denied that public revelation had come to an end. So what Joseph Ratzinger calls the silent apostasy has fabulized the early church as a place where anything goes, all under the blanket of some pneumatological delusion. Most genuine scholars of Christian antiquity find this grotesque fabulization utterly in consonant with the extant manuscripts that we possess from the first four centuries. It's probably fair to say that most of those leading the charge towards a mythical early church couldn't tell the difference between a Tertullian and a Trajan. St. Cyprian was famously described as having caused, almost caused a rift with Rome due to his fatal facility and polemic. So I shall learn from him and desist from further comment on our, further, on our current situation. Oh, sure. However, I have one last thing I want to say. There is a very, 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 very worrying trend in contemporary academia to find, you know, nuggets that sort of fit in with the current woke agenda. So you find a story of a woman impersonating holy orders in Cappadocia and everyone writes an article on it without ever having studied the Cyprianic Epistolarium or any of the background or even the languages. Okay? That's not scholarship, that's journalism. <laughs> we are scholars and we avoid that temptation by actually really trying to enter into dialogue with the entirety of the period that we're studying. You know, so we, we look at the writers, but we look at the background, we look at the empire, we look at the cultural elements, we look at the theology. We don't just cherry pick titles that we can hope to get published on, or at least I hope we don't. Um, the lecture this evening might feel or seem um, like a presentation of vignettes, but this is actually being what I'm presenting this evening will be published later this year in the Proceedings of a Conference uh, on Pneumatology from the University of Notre Dame over the summer that I presented at. Um, so anyway, let's get into it. First of all, ah yeah, I would like to pose the question. I think something that is very much missing in current scholarship on the Charismatica Pneumatica is why. What is the purpose of the Charismatic Gifts? What is the purpose of prophecy? These oracles of assurance, of admonition and election, why these prophetic visions? And 
The reason the question is not asked is because many contemporary scholars haven't read St. Thomas Aquinas. And I'm not a Dominican and I'm not a, I'm not a disciple of St. Thomas. I know he exists and he's been part of my formation. But Thomas simply states, in a nutshell, that the charismatic gifts occur, they exist for the multiplication of the faithful or for the strengthening of the faithful in times of persecution. Therefore, these phenomena have a purpose, as we see in the North African literature. For nearly every instance of a private revelation in the patristic corpus, Aquinas's justification can also be applied. So we've got to begin with Tertullian, writing from perhaps in his most active phase between 196 to 220. We all know he was a genius. He suffered fools with great difficulty. That's not necessarily a character flaw. And he dished out a vector with a plum, which probably is a character flaw. Um, his intellect was ferocious, and yet it was a humble intellect. His corpus leaves us entirely rich, a very, very rich uh, philosophic pneumatology. But in terms of personal experiential phenomena of the Holy Spirit, he says very little. However, at the end of his treatise on baptism, the first full treatise liturgically we have on the sacrament, he tells the newly baptized as they leave the font to lift up their hands in prayer and to ask God the Father for the charismatic gifts. His own accounts of the gift of prophecy in Carthage seem to be rather tame. In chapter nine of De Anima, he recounts the evidence of his sister, a Montanistic sister, living, uh, living in the church in Carthage. During the Sunday Eucharist, she would experience ecstatic visions, which is clearly in line with Tertullian's experience of the prophetic charism. Now, it has to be said, these are not the mode of ecstatic visions of what we hear about the Cataphrygians. She's not throwing herself on the ground, screaming aloud in various tongues, or things like that. Um, because that would disrupt the Eucharist, and she'd probably be kicked out. Rather, during her raptures, which she seems to be completely conscious, she speaks to the angels and to Christ. She receives auditory and visual communications, and she could discern the contents of people's hearts, their hidden thoughts. To those in need, she might prescribe a scripture verse, a psalm, or various prayers. Tertullian's interest in recounting this phenomenon was in her reports of the appearance of the soul, that the soul looked like the person to whom it was attached. But more interesting for us is that this woman remembers the content of her prophecies when she comes back from her ecstasies. And she's then examined, she's questioned by the elders of the church after the mass. Tertullian doesn't discuss the context of the oracles. But overall, we can say that the prophesying in the Montanistic community in Carthage seems more like a meeting of the charismatic renewal or a Pentecostal prayer service than the reports of Montanism we receive courtesy of Eusebius. It would seem that the attraction of the Montanistic community in uh, Carthage was more as a system of discipline. There's no evidence at all that there was actually an organized church of Montanism with a branch in Carthage. It might be more like here in Oxford if you're an Anglican, one day you go to St. Aldate's, the other day you go to Oriel College for Evensong. Like <laughs> um, but going back to Aquinas, and I've been to Evensong and Oriel before any of you look at me. I preached on demons there last night. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but going back to Aquinas, what's the purpose of this prophesying in Carthage? Well. It's the building up of the church, but it's also spiritual healing. The people coming to Christianity in Carthage were coming from a religion that venerated the cult of Baal and Tanit. These local Carthaginian deities, or demons, as Tertullian would call them, would, I think, really have seriously psychologically damaged their adherents due to the requirement for the ritual sacrifice of infants which the academic consensus now archeologically on Tunis has agreed upon. No one here needs me to draw the obvious parallels between that cult of infant sacrifice and what's going on in our contemporary culture. Just a few years into the literary career of Tertullian, wider Carthaginian society was swept up 
says in the Latin, et factus est populus immensus, by a group of catechumens, one of whom, Perpetua, was from a local family, probably a noble family. Her, eponym her eponymous companion, Felicity, is often characterized in Christian art as a slave. Irrespective of their social standing, the celebration of their faith and their bravery captured the imagination of, and very quickly entered into, the popular minds of the Christian tradition, as evidenced from the numerous references to their deaths in the early literature. From the mid-4th century onwards, their names have appeared in the Depositio Martyrum in Rome and entered into the canon of the Mass, Eucharistic Prayer Number 1, anchoring them in the liturgical life of the Christian Church. By the 6th century, they had already been immortalized in art in the Archiepiscopal Chapel in Ravenna. In the early 19th century, the saints were the inspiration for a highly perfumed rose bred for Louis-Philippe, the Duke of Orléans. The devotional appeal of St. Perpetua and her companions endures to this day. Their passio, the record of their suffering and death, is the most commented on Christian text outside of the Gospels. And one of the reasons for that must be the remarkable manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the condemned Christians. But before we get into any of that, Perpetua self-identifies as a prophetess. And what happens at her baptism is directly a reflection of Tertullian's instruction in his uh, De Baptismo, um, which I was going to quote in Latin, but no need for that. Um, the first two provisions. Perpetua has four, only two of which are prophetic. The other two pertain to a ministry of intercessory prayer. Um, Perpetua's brother requests, Domina soror, jam in mania dignationes, tanto ut postules visionum et ostendatu tibi an passio sit ancomiatus. Her brother asks her, my lady sister, you are so greatly favoured that you can ask for a vision to show us whether we are going to suffer or whether we will be released. Perpetua replies, and I knew that I was favoured by visions from God. And she says, et postulavi et ostensum est mihi hoc. I asked and I was shown this. When you see ostensum, mihi, together, you know the Latin is about to introduce a vision sequence. And this is one of my favourite rants. There are phenomenally wonderful translations of the Church Fathers from Latin and Greek into English, French, Italian, etc., etc. But very often in the translation, we miss the nuance. And very often in the translations in English, that nuance, that a vision or an inspiration of the Holy Spirit is about to occur, is missed out on. Because the variation in the Latin is just translated always in the same way as it was shown to me, what was shown to me, the giant chocolate bar in the sky, or I don't know, the fire of Pentecost or whatever. Anyhow, that's the second rant over. <laughs> the first vision um, follows. But before I talk about the vision, I want to say that Perpetua recounts the vision and it is then discussed by the Christians. So it's interpreted before it's set down. So before we even read it in the Passio, it has almost in a sense been ecclesially processed. Secondly, when Perpetua comes out of the vision, she uses the verb construction expertasum, which doesn't mean she was asleep. She's not having a dream. This is something different. It comes from the verb expergishi, which implies something other than waking from a natural sleep. Thirdly, Perpetua's vision does not fall into Epiphanius' definition of Montanistic visions. There's no evidence of her visions involving either glossolalia, the praying of tongues, or an ecstasy, which are primary characteristics of Montanism. Um, finally, when Perpetua emerges from her vision, she says that she can still taste the sweet honey of the bread that she's been given in the vision. So it provides a bridge between the realm of prophecy and reality, and it encourages us to accept the veracity of her experience, as well as her status as a prophetess, onto the vision. Perpetua sees a narrow bronze <coughs> ladder, mere magnitudinous, of wondrous size, that reaches from heaven to earth. Most scholars agree that this represents Jacob's ladder. Attached to the ladder are various sorts of weapons, swords, daggers, spikes, and hooks. 
which classical scholarship identifies as either the instruments of the passion of the martyrs or representing the path of suffering that leads to the purification of the spiritual life. More novel, we might say more woke uh, scholarly interpretations have opted to see the instruments as phallic, uh, which neither respects Perpetua's beliefs, but I think most charitably we should just leave them as saying they're original. Um, at the foot of the ladder is Satan, taking his traditional form of the great Draco, the dragon of Genesis and the Apocalypse. He again is described in Latin as mire magnitudinis, an enormous dragon of terrifying size. The dragon has a twofold purpose. He is there to deter and to terrify, perhaps to prevent Perpetua from undergoing the sufferings of martyrdom, but also to attack. One particular feminist scholar sees the dragon as another phallic symbol. Saint Augustine, thanks be to God, would differ. He writes, Calcatus est ergo draco pede castro et victoria vestigio. He says that essentially, Perpetua will stand on the head of the dragon and conquer over him, uh, as the first female did. And so the obvious parallel between Perpetua and Eve in the book of Genesis. Saturus, who's the catechist of the uh, young martyr of the catechumens in prison, ascends the ladder before Perpetua and warns her of the danger of the dragon beneath, to which Perpetua responds very interestingly, Non me no cebit in nomine Jesu Christi, he shall not harm me in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the literal translation. But in liturgical terms, this use of the holy name represents a prayer of binding. Perpetua has essentially bound the evil spirit. And then almost as if he is afraid of her, the dragon slowly extends his head on the ground and Perpetua steps on his head to ascend the ladder of suffering to arrive in paradise. Um, she, she immediately recounts the contents of this vision to her fellow Christians, and they interpret the content together, intellectimus, it says in Latin. As I said, this means that the vision, is pro uh, the vision has been processed by the church before it was set to paper, but that does not detract from its prophetic value. But if we apply Aquinas' hermeneutic here, What's the purpose of the vision? The vision is a telos. The Holy Spirit is preparing the martyrs to be for death. That is the purpose of the vision. It's the edification of the faithful. So remember the classic definition of Aquinas, visions, prophecies occur for the propagation of the faith or for the strengthening of the faithful. This is clearly for the strengthening of the faithful. 50 years later, things have settled down in Carthage the Christian population has exploded, and Cyprian, the prophet, bishop, has the care of the church. Um, his first oneurological intervention, in his 10th epistle of the Epistolarium, offers one of the most interesting utterances of prophetic speech in the early Christian corpus. He's writing to some of his confessors who are being held in prison. Um, among those being held in prison, undergoing torture, is a young man called Mepalicus, who dies during the process. This letter, I've always said, shows Cyprian at his exhortatory best. Cyprian's Latin is beautiful, it's rhetorically rich, it's replete with military imagery. He writes um, in section two, it's possibly his own homage to the literary form of the Passio. Videt admirans presentium multitude celeste certamen deet spiritale prelium Christi, luebet sanguis qui incendium pesecunstinus estinguret, qui flamas et inias gehene gloriosa cruares sopiret. Heady stuff from the Monday night that he has. <laughs> the entire celestial court watched the battle of the warriors of Christ. The blood flowed and quenched the fires of persecution. The gore quench the fly fires and flames of hell. There we go. Mepalicus um, <coughs> appears not only in Cyprian's letter here, but also then in the Martyrology of Bede, the Venerable, uh, using the exact wording of Epistle 10, demonstrating the value of the Epistolarium of Cyprian as a future historical source. Um, he also appears in the 7th century of the Martyrologium Heromanianum. Anyway, Cyprian 
in his prophetic, uh, his use of prophecy, his favorite uh, scripture verse is Matthew 10, 19, where Christ promises his followers that in times of persecution, the Holy Spirit will place necessary words in their mouths. In Epistle 10, Cyprian links this scripture to the confession of the soon-to-be martyr Mepalicus. As Mepalicus was being tortured, he called out, Videbis Krasagonum, tomorrow you will see the struggle. It's very unusual. Almost always in the accounts of the martyrs, the syntax of the confession of faith is Christianus sum, Christianus sum, which means Christianus sum, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, yeah. So that is always the classic formula that is, that is written in the Passiones. Mepalicus on the set, on the other hand, seems to blend his confession with that of a prophecy. And Jacques Namat, who did the French translation of the, um, in the Source Chrétien of the, um, of the Passion of Perpetual Felicity, says that Cyprian seems to be trying to portray here that the martyrs almost become an instrument of the Spirit, that the Spirit speaks directly through them. And so the martyr's voice is described as plena spiritus sancto, and Cyprian uses the word proruperit, that the voice of the Holy Spirit erupts, erupts from the mouth of, um, of, um, of, um, <clears throat> of Mepalicus. And the instance of Mepalicus also raises a very interesting question. Does the prophetic gift emerge and manifest more frequently before the church is about to enter into times of persecution? So in the 1970s, when the Archbishop of Canterbury and Cardinal Soonans all got together and they wrote their book on how the new age of the Holy Spirit was dawning on the Christian world, and we were all going to build a green hill in Zion and set up a new church away from Canterbury and away from Rome, could it be that they were mistaken? Could it be that that outpouring of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that seemed to have occurred in that decade were a warning to the Christian world of the mass apostasy that was to come and possibly of persecution of Christianity, which is beginning in so many ways that we can all think of? Um, private revelations from the Holy Spirit also assist Cyprian in clerical appointments. I could, make an I could make a comment there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I have a bishop whom I fear and respect and obey. <laughs> obey. I obey. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, in Epistle 39, Cyprian writes to his clergy to announce the appointment of a confessor. In this case, uh, a man called Celerinus to the office of lecture. Um, pains are taken to emphasize his spiritual pedigree. He's the grandson of a martyr, and he has two uncles who are also martyrs. This young man had endured 19 days in prison, had been tortured, was held in irons, irons rather. And Cyprian says, Tanta Domini Dignatione Venientum, implying that somehow some miraculous action of the Holy Spirit operated and sustained this young man through the various trials he had suffered. Small wonder that Cyprian should seek to prevail upon him to join the ranks of the cler clergy. But from a political point of view, with Cyprian under siege, um, an ally of this quality, a confessor, would greatly strengthen his position. Celerinus um, was hesitant. But in an echo of the text of the Shepherd of Hermas, then he receives a vision in which the church herself appears to him and asks him to accept ordination. This is the first time that we read in Cyprian where the recipient of the vision is not is not the bishop. Generally, it is the bishop who receives visions. It is the bishop who is the charismatic. Um, and it's the only occasion in the corpus, in the Cyprianic corpus, where the recipient of an actual vision or a dream is, um, is a confessor. But it shows us something. It shows us that visions and dreams, gifts the charisma of the Holy Spirit, is still occurring in the wider Christian church although it is now beginning to decrease and visions become less and less and less. Um, but also, it also shows that charismatic activity seems to be concentrated in a circle around the person of the diocesan bishop. So we're seeing the first 
concentration here of charismatic and ecclesiological authority. On to a question about the liturgy. Um, the 63rd letter in the corpus is very interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, it's the first extant Latin source that treats the liturgical preparation of the Eucharistic chalice at length. <clears throat> it also offers us an example for the first time of Cyprian writing as a metropolitan bishop to a suffragan bishop. The recipient, Cecilius of Bilta, is clearly a bishop, and Cyprian presumes that this letter, with his instructions, will be widely circulated across the, Nor across the North African Episcopal College. Inside the boundaries of his own jurisdiction, the bishop is the moderator of the liturgy, and it's his duty, and within his power, to regulate the norms surrounding the celebration of the Eucharist. Outside of that jurisdiction, and in the middle of the third century, the power of a metropolitan bishop to interfere in the affairs of another diocese is by no means clear. What's very interesting here is that Cyprian is not naturally pugnacious. He doesn't demonstrate any zeal for interfering in the affairs of other bishops. But his decision to intervene in this way on the liturgy is very telling, because it would appear that he is doing so because he has received directly an admonition from the Holy Spirit, um, instructing him to put a stop to liturgical abuses on the part of his priests. Now, I don't know about any of you, but if my archbishop sent a letter to all of his priests saying, the Holy Spirit has told me that you have to start doing this when you're saying Mass, I can only imagine uh, the reception a letter like that would get. Um, I don't think it was probably that different back in the third century. The great patristic scholar um, Adolf von Harnack is completely dismissive of this letter. He says the Latin's beautiful and he accuses Cyprian of being too weak to impose his will, so he resorted to um, he resorted to the Holy Spirit to press his point, all the while feigning humility so as to shield himself from the criticism of playing the dictator bishop. In case I'm not clear, Harnack's calling Cyprian a liar. <laughs> Bardi is more so, and you know, really, we do actually have to ask ourselves as scholars of patristics, we've gained a lot from the rationalist school, but the rationalist school, the gains have come at a price. They have imposed upon the texts the hermeneutic of suspicion, which means that the first assumption has to be the miraculous and the charismatic cannot occur. And that seems to very much come, I think, probably from the, uh, the impact of historic criticism in scripture being, ported into, being imported into patristics. And of course, we have benefited hugely from uh, historical criticism in scripture. But also, there, always, there is always the danger that if we make an idol of historical criticism, we then essentially eject God from the equation, whether it's in the scriptures themselves, whether it's in these patristic commentaries on the scriptures. Um, I kind of think I'm not going to go through. I will say one thing about letter 63. It is the, f Cyprian instructs his bishops, um, you are to prepare the chalice exactly as Christ did. And he says that the Holy Spirit has told him this, an admonitio. Um, the problem is, the gospel don't actually tell us how Christ prepared the chalice. It just says he took the chalice, he offered the chalice, he gave the chalice to his disciples. It doesn't say that he put red wine, white wine, one drop of water, ten drops of water. The actual specifics of the preparation of the chalice are not covered uh, in the gospel. So Cyprian constructs a liturgical argument from scripture. And in doing so, you can read Epistle 63, it's upstairs in the the blue book, The Fathers of the Church in English, if you want to go and read it. But it's interesting that in, in this letter, Cyprian invokes the Holy Spirit more than in any other text in the Cyprianic corpus. It's almost as if one might say the Spirit and Cyprian, or Cyprian's receiving inspiration on which scriptural texts to use. But just as an example, he identifies first, he is the first Christian writer uh, to identify the sacrifice of Melchizedek with the bread and wine consecrated in the Eucharist. Um, he also uh, makes reference to the fact that Solomon's use of bread and wine is also the Holy Spirit uh, making, using that as a typos of the Eucharistic species. 
and we just skip ahead all of that because we just went all night on that. Cyprian's rise through the clergy of Carthage was, meteor was me meteoric um, and not universally well received. Um, clergy generally aren't prone to envy or jealousy <laughs> until, <laughs> until they get passed over from the position of bishop. And of course, um, Cyprian passed over many of his colleagues um, for, for the position of the Bishop of Carthage. And the see of Carthage was extremely prestigious. Um, six years into his episcopacy, it can be observed that after persecution and plague, the already disgruntled and perhaps the newly disillusioned were bound to be displeased with Cyprian and his admittedly somewhat autocratic style of episcopal governance. After all, Cyprian Stylus had whipped the Order of Virgins, castigated those who feared death, and transferred ecclesial power from the confessors and the martyrs and reinvested it into the person of the bishop. And he had used dreams and visions to do all this. Now we do know at this point, by the middle of the third century, as the larger church was increasing, the value attributed to the visions and dreams of martyrs was, had begun to markedly decrease um, in that period between Perpetua and Cyprian. So Epistle 66, which is a criticism of Cyprian's dreams and visions, brings into clear focus the conflict between what I would call the ordinarily charismatic and growing Church of the Masses, as opposed to the extraordinarily charismatic and shrinking Church of the Martyrs. Harnack sees in Letter 66 the consummation of Cyprian's enthusiasm and in the charismatic sense and his episcopacy. A man, a confessor called um, Pupianus, writes to Cyprian with a series of accusations. Uh, his letter is not extant, but Cyprian replies to them systematically, and so we have a pretty good idea of what the, um, what the, what the complaints are. It's a rather extraordinary letter. Cyprian is painfully polite, constantly. Everything goes always, te carissime frater, te octo bene valias. Um, not this one. All gone. Pupianus is called te frater, there's no carissime. And it's the only letter in the... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when somebody calls me carissimo in Rome, I always start to worry. <laughs> um, but, um, and every letter in the Ciceronian, uh, rather in the Cyprianic corpus, is signed off with a modification of Cicero, te opto carissime frate bene valias. Not in this one. More, in, more, in, more uncharacteristic Cyprian is his sarcastic invective, where he says, Pupianus solis integer, inviolatus sanctus pudicus, qui nobis miscere se noluit in paradiso atque in renia celorum solus habitabit. Basically, you think you're so pure, you think you're so holy, what are you going to do when you're all alone in heaven because no one else is worthy to be there with you? Um, it's very, very uncharacteristic for um, Cyprian to have a lapse in charity like that. But Pupianus had questioned the validity of Cyprian's Episcopal consecration already well-trodden ground. He also accuses Cyprian of a lack of humility, to which Cyprian responds saying, my humility is celebrated through all of Africa. <laughs> I mean, I can never quite figure from the Latin whether he's trying to be ironic there. Um, what cuts much closer to the bone is that Pupiana says that the church in Carthage has been divided because of Cyprian, and particularly because of the dreams and visions by which Cyprian has governed. He calls them somnia ridicula et visiones ineptas, stupid dreams and ridiculous visions. Cyprian's tone in the response really does suggest that he was incandescent upon receipt of the letter. Um, <clears throat> Harnack sees this letter as a backlash against Montanism and the beginning of a movement in Christianity that would not only start to doubt the value of visions and dreams, but within the next century, by the time we hit Augustine, would ultimately come to see dreams and visions as being diabolical. And probably if you're an average Roman Catholic, or I imagine you're an average Anglican, and you go and tell your parish priest I've had a vision, he's gonna look at you. First of all, he'll think you're mad. Second of all, he'll probably 
well, if he believes in the devil, he might think you're possessed. But third of all, the most unlikely response you're going to get is that you're, you might be taken seriously. You know, There are, of course, norms issued by the Vatican on how to analyze all that stuff, so we don't need to worry. Um, what was I going to say? Actually, in fact, no, I should say that um, uh, in January, at the plenary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Pope Francis did ask the congregation to come up with a set of norms to assist diocesan bishops in assessing the validity and the sense of uh, private revelations because those things are occurring uh, so much more frequently these days. Um, but um, let me just skip ahead and just say that the final controversy that Cyprian is involved with, that most people who study the period will be aware of, is his um, fight with Pope Stephen of Rome on the question of the rebaptism of heretics. Cyprian is like an attack dog in this controversy. He keeps on going back against uh, the Bishop of Rome, uh, despite the fact that, as my supervisor Mark Edwards writes, uh, Stephen menacingly rattles the keys of Peter in uh, Cyprian's face. It doesn't in any way um, it doesn't in any way deter him. But it's very interesting. Cyprian is theologically incorrect in the baptism controversy. He says we must rebaptize. Christians, we generally we don't rebaptize. Um, and in all of this controversy, there is not a single private revelation that Cyprian refers to to suggest that his theological position is correct. And it's very, 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 very interesting that for an episcopacy marked by so many pneumatological phenomena, the silence of the Holy Spirit in this particular controversy where Cyprian is wrong is very telling. Because as soon as the controversy passes, and as we enter into the final year of Cyprian's life, um, it is marked by extraordinary visions and uh, references to those visions in his letters. But within the rebaptism controversy, there's nothing. And I think if we think again to St. Thomas Aquinas, that visions, dreams, and prophecies build up the church, the rebaptism controversy did the opposite. It almost caused a schism between Rome and Carthage. In fact, if Stephen and Cyprian hadn't been martyred, they were both stubborn enough probably to have excommunicated each other. Stephen had broken communion with the churches in the East. And then in the hundred years afterwards, it fueled the Donatist controversy. But none of that dynamic is accompanied by any vision of the Holy Spirit to justify or back up Cyprian's, um, Cyprian's essentially Cyprian's crusade. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, but I'd like to leave you with a patristic exegesis that I think reflects uh, what I think that, I think that must be remembered, that wherever the Holy Spirit is active, so is the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not acting by himself. This, the Trinity is always present. We're Trinitarian Christians. We have to remember that. In the confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, in one commentary, the Spirit is described as the actual plasmic divine fire that falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. And so the entire Trinity is present in the scene. The Father is holding all of the reality you know, in existence. God the Son, the Word, is inspiring and speaking to Elijah, and God the Holy Spirit actually takes on the form of fire to descend and consume, um, to consume Elijah's sacrifice. And I think at this crucial moment in the life of Christianity, we too, all of us who are believing Christians, must also be transformed by that fire. You know, fire destroys, but it also purifies, it warms we have to be agents of the Spirit and the Church and the world. Christianity has been worked through worse crises than our current difficulties. The Spirit working through faithful Christians of the Aryan crisis brought about a doctrinal stability that lasted for a millennium. Think of Athanasius, the Cappadocians, Didymus the Blind, all of those who were open to the ordinary and extraordinary charisms. In our time, we as Christians know, that if we remain faithful to the Holy Spirit's inspirations and to his guidance under the pneumatologically established body of teachings that God defends and protects, we know, we know that God the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the God the Father and God the Son, 
will bring about a resolution and renewal in the Church of our time that immeasurably exceeds our hopes and our dreams. And I'm going to finish with the very, very ancient Latin prayer. Veni Sancte Spiritus, reple tuorum corde fidelium, et tui amoris in eas inium ecende, emiti spiritum tuum et creabuntur, et renovabis faciem tere. Amen. Thank you very much. Yeah.